what do you varnish it with? Um, it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another Ray Renaissance vlog. I'm going to talk relatively little about music today. Instead, I'm going to tell you about an unconventional Renaissance artist called Matthias Grunewald and this fantastical looking gamba which he painted and which will soon be in the hands of the Ray Renaissance team. Well, a 3D version of it will. That's right, for those of you who haven't yet heard the news, Ray Renaissance commissioned this unusual looking instrument from historical luthier Jacob Mariani, who luckily for us is always up for those more weird and wonderful iconographical challenges like this one. And the big reveal will be happening at this month's Ray Renaissance concert, where Jacob will also be appearing to talk about the instrument, so stay tuned to hear more about that. But first, let's talk about the original, the painted instrument, and the enormous double-winged scene-changing altarpiece to which it belongs, which is quite literally Grunewald's greatest work, because if you go by surface area, then this one altarpiece contains most of his surviving painting. The artistic skill here and attention to detail is very impressive, so Grunewald was either familiar with this kind of instrument or possibly even working from a model. So why is it that the instrument and its player just look a little bit… off? It seems to be incredibly precise, but it's proportionally misleading, recognisable as a kind of gamba, but somehow warped in its shape and playing position. It's almost as though this is supposed to be a dreamlike representation of a Renaissance string consort. And looking around the rest of the altarpiece, the musicians and their instruments are certainly not the only dream or nightmare-like features. So what's going on here? You might have heard the rumour that the fantastical scenes of some early surrealist painters have a link to the psychedelic drug LSD. Think of the work of Hieronymus Bosch, for example. His hellscapes are full of creepy demons and monsters and strange goings-on, perhaps reminiscent of drug-induced hallucinations. But if you've heard this rumour and you imagined that artists such as Bosch or Grunewald were taking recreational LSD before getting down to work, well, I hate to disappoint you, but the true possible connection of these artworks to LSD is not quite as simple as that. And it's certainly not as fun. Modern synthesized LSD comes from a parasitic mold called ergot, which happens to grow very happily on rye grains. And back in the Middle Ages, they didn't have the clean, isolated lab version of ergot. They had the moldy food version. Now, the moldy food version did cause vivid hallucinations, but it also caused burning pain, convulsions, and gangrene so bad that your limbs might just detach from your body. I can't speak for everyone, but it wouldn't be my choice of recreational drug. The disease became known, among other things, as hellfire, because it was believed to be a punishment from God on those afflicted by it. And the theory goes that some of these surrealist artworks might be visualizations of the nightmarish torment experienced by its sinful sufferers. So perhaps this is what's going on with Grunewald's painting. But I'm not telling you all this just because it's kind of interesting. The surrealism of Grunewald's painting makes building one of those instruments particularly challenging. 
We do know that other, less surreal looking instruments in this style exist in other artworks around the same time. And there are certain physical parameters that have to be met when building an instrument like this to ensure that it doesn't collapse or explode under the tension of the strings, and also to make sure that it's able to play the repertoires that we know it was probably used for in the Renaissance. And this has all sorts of implications on things like the size of the instrument, the thickness of its waist, the length of its neck, the distance of the frets. So how was Jacob, our luthier, supposed to construct a functional and stable instrument from a picture possibly designed to look like a hallucination? I followed him to one of his workshop spaces to see if I could get some answers. Have you ever had a commission this bizarre before? No, this is, this is absolutely the craziest um, request, but also maybe the most exciting. The task was to translate the painting for the players here in Basel. So it's not a direct sort of mechanical copying of the image, but something that carries the aesthetic over and reflects the requirements of our performers here in Basel. It looks like a vial, but Almost everything about it is, um, takes a different approach. It might seem like the Eisenheim altarpiece instrument in terms of the way it, it feels, but almost everything about it is somehow changed and translated into ergonomic terms. Every time is an interpretation and translation, even if it's really highly detailed and it's clear that the artist was painting from life and doing life studies, there's always something that requires um, translating or interpreting to reach the ground in the concert stage in practical terms. You got maple back and sides and a spruce soundboard, but it's uh, very lightly varnished um, to sort of match the aesthetic of the painting. The same kind of wood you'd use for cellos and vials in general. And what do you varnish it with? Um, it's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> I see. <laughs> you have an idea, you have a vision for it, or I mean vision maybe is the wrong word because we're thinking about the sound as well as the structure and you can project a bit but this, this shape and its details are so strange that um, it's a bit of a surprise every time we set it up and do adjustments and um, we're learning a lot which is really really great. Want to hear more? Well, come and join us in the Historic Museum in Basel on Sunday the 24th of April to hear this instrument in concert. As usual, there will be two concert performances, one at 5.15 and one at 7.15 p.m. Central European time, and we will film it for you. So if you can't be there live, but you want to hear this brand new instrument in action, then just keep an eye on our website, our YouTube channel, and our other social media. And if you are joining us live in the Historic Museum, then make sure to also be there between the two performances at around 6.30 p.m. because Jacob himself will be making an appearance to tell us more about this dreamy gamba and how he brought it to life. See you there. <laughs>